distinct pleasures this evening. The first is to welcome all of you here. It's so encouraging to see such a full house, such wonderful support for preservation in Newburyport. We all know its importance, and thank you very much for the support. The museum is proud to invite and host and work with our friends at the Preservation Trust. Uh, the condition of this building, the expertise we employ in the daily management of the museum is often on their shoulders. And we welcome them and we encourage them and I think you're gonna find that this is a tremendous program that they put together for this year. My other pleasure this evening is to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, you will probably know him as Kevin McDonald, our curator. You may not also know he is a Harvard graduate student. He comes to us from Harvard. In fact, just last night, I understand, he did his thesis reading. Oh. So, so, so keep in mind, this presentation was put together in the midst of all of that as well. <laughs> and one other thing that you'll discover if you haven't been aware of this already, is we have a very, we have a, a wonderful fondness for Kevin, for his style, for the grace and manner in which he displays his talents, and has helped us in this museum to grow. And uh, tonight is an excellent example of exactly what Mr. McDonald can do. So without further ado, please welcome our wonderful speaker, Kevin. All right, well, thank you for coming out tonight. <clears throat> um, obviously, the theme of Newburyport Preservation Week 2012 is the waterfront. And I was asked to provide sort of an overview of Oh, just 350 years worth of history on the waterfront, so uh, I'll see if I can get through it in anything under about four hours. <laughs> this is a picture of the, uh, you know, the recent waterfront, and it's because I couldn't find a picture, surprisingly, of, of the original waterfront in 1635. <laughs> Back then, it was just a series of coves and promontories, so there were some areas that sort of came inland, and there were some areas that sort of stuck out as, as large rocks. These promontories that stuck out, they were uh, east of the firehouse. They were east of Ferry Wharf, which is about halfway between us here. There was another outcropping of rock just to the west of us right here. The, uh, the promontory in the middle at Ferry Wharf, that was pretty sizable and they actually called it the Great Rock. And there was evidence uh, found there during a 1977 archeological excavation that there were uh, seasonal uh, Native American camps there, fishing camps. In the 1620s or so, there was a European settler who uh, has been immortalized by the name of Watts, who came to the area and built a storage cellar uh, in the area of where Market Square is now. Nobody's really sure exactly where that was, but you know, for years they've they used it as boundary markers. Everybody seemed to know where Watts' cellar was, but uh, we've sort of lost the. Uh, I, the location of that exactly. And of course, the town of Newbury was founded in 1635 and there was always a tie to the waterfront, regardless of what happened later on when, when the port area split. As early as 1641, they started to build the roadways that we kind of know here now. Uh, between 1641 and 1640, uh, 1655, they built Federal Street, they built uh, Merrimack and Water Street that's out, out here. Market and State Street were all built at this time, and it was really to get from the plantation that's up the hill that way, back down to the water area and take advantage of the resources down here by the river. So one of the effects of the road was that it allowed for f the first private grants along the waterfront. This is a, an image, and you'll see maybe four or five of these from the 1977 archeological excavation. Uh, this was their full report that they made, and they had some of these maps that they drew up of what the central waterfront looked like at various time periods. The first, this was the first one around 1700, and in 1655 the first grant was made for a private uh, landing along the waterfront, and that was what you see right up at the top there, where it says Captain White's Warehouse Point near that A1. That was the Great Rock. You can still see it in this picture. So there was a rock that jutted out into the river. And uh, it was conditional. The, the town of Newbury uh, told Captain White that he had to build a wharf and a warehouse within three years of uh, being granted that, and he did. And then by 1700, when this map was drawn, or uh, this map represents, there were six additional grants. And you can see a few of them along what's Water Street there. And there were two to Richard Dole, and you can see his name there, 1675 and 78. 
He was listed in Newburytown Records as a merchant as early as 1640, so you can already see, even at that early date, that there were people sort of down by the waterfront area that were being tagged as merchants versus the people that were sort of back in the Newbury Plantation area proper who were listed as agriculturalists. Then Nathaniel Clark, who's at the top there, 1680, uh, he was a merchant also. By 1684, he had been chosen to be the naval officer for the area of Salisbury and um, Newbury here. And he was chosen because there was already at that point, as they quoted, some small trade here on the, on the river. So. Then by 1722, uh, things had really taken off. There was more than uh, 225 waterfront lots by that date that had been created and distributed to folks. But they had also had the foresight, obviously, to reserve several ways. Some were private, some were public, but ways down to the water. In 1725, the third parish church was built uh, right at the intersection out here of Merrimack State and uh, Water Street. The museum is up here in this corner, beyond Clark's Wharf. So where the bull nose is right now, that's where the church actually was built. It was the third parish church because the church was there. Obviously, a town sort of grew up around it. And in 16, uh, 1764, the town was incorporated, Newburyport, for the first time. Here's an image that was engraved right around the same time, about 10 years after, after uh, Newburyport became its own town. I'm sure people have seen this before. This is um, by Ben Johnston and George Searle. And this is a view from the burial hill across the frog pond and all the way down to the riverside there. And what this shows you is really a typical New England sort of port development. Um, you can see, uh, for example, the churches and the public buildings are located either on high ground, for example, in this foreground, or there's the church on Market Square that's right in the middle of everything. So that was either, you know, you were either on high ground or you were in the middle of everything if you were a public building. That allowed people to settle right near the water. And you can see how nucleated the settlement is in this picture. There aren't really people who are living anywhere outside of a very certain specific area of about, you know, maybe eight, ten blocks, something like that. What happens when the, when the area is settled right in the middle like that by everybody is that the industrial functions are pushed to the edge of town. So you can see in this picture here that what's labeled C there, that was a, a rope walk and that's where the mall is right now. Right where that long building is with the C on top of it. That was a rope walk where they created rope for the ship. And that's the mall? That's the mall, correct, yeah. Here's a picture right around the same time period, uh, 1770. And you can see that red line there marks the 1700 map that we saw earlier. So that was that original shoreline that we saw with the rock at the top there that was the Great Rock. And you can see already how things started to fill in. So there's a lot of change over the 70 years since we saw the last map there. And you can see a lot of building activity on the actual wharves themselves. That was to support what was becoming a really burgeoning merchant trade at the time. I mentioned on this uh, map here the middle shipyard, which was one of three at the time. There was a shipyard also at the end of Federal Street and one at Market Street. There was also several different kinds of industries that shipping actually helped support, obviously. So some of these buildings that you see here were distilleries, they were sail making, rope making, sugar houses, that kind of a thing. It was everything that had to do with ships and the stuff they brought in. And on this, so on this map, I'll just mention a few of the wharves here. You see on the left, uh, Tracy's Wharf. That was uh, Patrick Tracy. He was a wealthy merchant prior to the Revolution. And uh, I'm sure you know his wedding gift to his son, Nathaniel, which is the library up on State Street here. Ferry Wharf is uh, so named, naturally enough, because the ferry ran from there starting in the 1680s. They ran across to Salisbury. Uh, Starkey's Wharf, which is sort of up in the top corner there. Starkey was a uh, ship's captain, William Starkey, and he was also a merchant. And the last wharf here was Timothy Toppins. He was a block maker, which is a function that supports shipbuilding. So. And you've already discovered that the town landing listed there was our Custom House Way that's beside us right now. It's about in the same location. So you can see again how much filled in and then this next map is kind of the same idea but it's about it's about 40 years later so this is around 1810 and I'll just pop back here for a minute 
you can see the amount of buildings that were built within that intervening 40 years on these wharves. The years between 1770 and 1810, of course, are considered to be the golden age here in Newburyport, and it's reflected, obviously, in the number of these buildings. By 1775, 60% of the men in the town were engaged in maritime-related occupations. What that allowed Newburyport to do during the Revolutionary War was to raise effectively a private navy, and uh, this capital that they brought in from privateering helped to create this newly wealthy um, post-revolutionary merchant class that is reflected in how many buildings are here. That says Butcher's, butcher's Shambles. And what that is was uh, right around this time was when Market Square started to actually have a market building, which they did not quite have yet. So what those were were temporary stalls where there would be butchers and fishermen and market uh, produce people and stuff right there. So I point out on this one, we've seen uh, Greenleaf's Wharf. We've seen that before. That was the former Tracy Wharf. Ferry Wharf is still right where you'd expect it to be. Then there's this rather large area here called Boardman's Wharf, and we heard about Often Boardman. I don't want to preempt anybody, but uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell at least one story. The reason, he has, the reason he has such a large wharf is because he, you know, he was sort of relatively wealthy, and the relative size of the wharf matches that. I'll tell the story that in 1770, everybody's probably heard some version of it anyway, but the British ship Friends that was loaded with supplies for Boston, troops in Boston, somehow managed to confuse Ipswich Bay with Boston Harbor. And uh, Boardman and 17 of his sailors took three small boats out to the ship Friends. They represented themselves as harbor pilots and were allowed on board. And once they got on board, they took control of the ship, brought it into Newburyport. And he was actually a very successful privateer. He took many more than just that ship. You can also see, besides the red line, which I've left in there to show you the original 1700 shoreline, just so you can kind of get an idea of how much it's changed since its sort of early inception. But you can see a black dotted line that goes up around the wharf like that. That's the extent of the fire of 1811. So you'll see, you see how much of the central waterfront and the wharf area burns during that disaster. Obviously a combination of that fire in 1811, there was uh, the embargo in 1807, the Jeffersonian embargo that really had a, uh, it, it basically depressed any trade to basically Europe. But, uh, and then of course the war that broke out as a result of that, the War of 1812. And that really signaled uh, the end of the golden age for Newburyport. And things changed after that. Here's an engraving that shows the city in, uh, well still town in 1839. It's kind of interesting because uh, not only is it sort of a squashed perspective so that they can get as much of the waterfront in as possible, but it's also an interesting time, 1839. There was diminished trade, obviously, after War of 1812, and there was actually a depression throughout the 1820s. So the town was, like a lot of towns in America, um, in tough shape. It, it diminished in importance as a port, Newburyport, during this time. They were still active enough that the Custom House was built in 1835, so uh, it hadn't gone completely belly up yet. But why this is interesting is because the next year after this, 1840, the railroad came in. And when it did, they began, op uh, began operation of steam-powered mills here in Newburyport, and a textile industry sort of took off at that point. That, that structure is what's known as the other chain bridge, actually. So it's not the chain bridge that everybody knows and loves, it's a bridge that existed, it was built in 1827. It's right about where this bridge by Winter Street is right now. This big Route 1 bridge right here. And it was a suspension bridge along the same lines as the beloved chain bridge that's further down, further up river. Also during, uh, right, you know, right when the railroad came in, you'll also have shipbuilding that would actually rebound because Donald McKay came here to Newburyport and opened a shipyard in 1841. He built a ship called Courier in 1842, which was sort of an early design clipper trading type ship, which is of course what he became known for. He perfected the design of the clipper ship when he moved to East Boston in 1845, but of course here in Newburyport, you know, they had a little bit of a head start, and so they had some of the designs and they actually built clippers here into the 1850s. Which brings me to 1850. Here you see the central waterfront that's right around this 1850. At this point, Newburyport was considered small and it had been eclipsed by major ports like Boston and Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Although it did still have business going in and out. Uh, raw materials for the mills 
and manufactured finished goods were still shipped in and out by sea. And in 1849, the California Gold Rush uh, saw the, the need for ships and supplies to be taken from the East Coast to the West Coast. And there were a lot of Newburyport captains that ran that route. When did the river start silting up? The river has always silted up, believe it or not. And it's been cleared numerous times. There's actually some, uh, I'm going to say 1780s. I'd have to check my notes, not these notes. But um, there was a petition made to the state by the Newburyport town fathers in the, uh, around the 1780s to basically have some dredging of the, of the you know, can we have money to, to clear the channel because it would con constantly silt up. So. In this view, prominent here, you'll, still, you'll see City Wharf now, which was the former Greenleaf, and then prior to that, the Davenport. And then Ferry Wharf is still there. And you notice that the public way is the way to Ferry Wharf. Not surprising, people would have to get on the ferry. You'll see where uh, Boardman's Wharf was. Now it's called Granger's. Um, that's uh, formerly where often Boardman had his house and shops and stores. George Granger owned a large uh, lumber yard. And uh, so he supplied the shipbuilding industry with lumber. And that area was actually open area uh, for years at this point after this. He sold it in 1854 to Newman Brown, who was one of the first dealers in cordwood and coal, which would become important later on. And I just mentioned from the archaeological survey, right around this time to support the textile mills, the labor, they started to import immigrant labor. And I don't know if you can see right here where it says A4 in the middle right there. There's evidence there of uh, there and right in front of it, closer to Water Street, of two tenement houses where there would have been immigrant laborers uh, living down by the water. They were segregated down by the water. That was the, the bad place to live. So. Who are the immigrants? There, was, there were immigrants from I Ireland, obviously. Um, there was Eastern Europeans, yeah. So hopefully this next part will be fun for everybody. We're going to paint uh, engraved around the same time was this picture in 1846. This is by Gloucester artist Fitz Henry Lane, formerly Fitz Hugh Lane, if you know him by that name. And uh, he was primarily known as a maritime painter and he did this beautiful lithograph or engraving of Newburyport as seen from pretty much the same vantage point we've been seeing a lot of these pictures from across the river in Salisbury. The picture has been reprinted many times, and it's often hand-colored, which it is here. This is a version that's available at the New York Public Library. The color doesn't quite show as well as it does on the screen here, but you get the idea that it's tinted at least. And just looking at this picture, you'd think the importance of it really lies in what's going on here in the foreground, which is there's some outfitting of ships, and then this main activity in the middle here is barrel making. So there's a lot of wood and barrel staves and what have you. You'll notice also that half of the canvas, so to speak, is all sky here. And that'll come up later on. I'll mention that again. But uh, the great thing about this picture, and you can see a version of it right over here on the easel, is that uh, because it was engraved, it has an actual quite high fidelity to the background. And if you look here, you're just like, OK, it's Newburyport in the background. But it's shocking the kind of detail that's in there. And to that end, we're going to go walk through that. So this was ours before it got cleaned up a little bit. You can see it's kind of dirty there, but we'll be looking at uh, this version. And I've gotten the material for this portion of the presentation from Robert Cheney, who I'm sure many people here in town know. He was a local historian, a mariner. He wrote a um, very well-known book about shipbuilding on the Merrimack called Shipbuilding on the Merrimack. <laughs> <laughs> And we're lucky to have uh, a lot of uh, what he collected. And what he collected were people's stories. He collected, uh, you know, his knowledge of the history of this area was probably unparalleled. And um, lucky for us, he typed up a lot of it. He had a lot of photographs that he collected from people here in the town as early as sort of the 1920s. But they were photographs from an earlier age. And we're very, very lucky here at the museum to have this entire collection. So one of the things that I was very taken by was he had seen this image and then discussed it in great detail. So now we are going to go through and discuss it in great detail. And I give all the credit to Robert Cheney. And what we're going to do is move from left to right here. So you'll see sort of the waterfront area. I'll pan through each image will be the next 
one to the right. Okay, so we're going to start here. And there's a brig in the front here, and be behind the rigging of that brig, you can see warehouses that are on Coombs Wharf and Johnson's Wharfs. So in that location right there, where that sort of white building is between the rigging. If you then move down, you see these two warehouses right here. Uh, they look like they've got a lot of windows in them and they're joined in the middle. Those were um, two brick buildings on Bartlett's Wharf. The one closest to the water was the Cashman machine shop and the one eventually, and the one closer into where Water Street is was uh, the Fiberloid company that made celluloid film and uh, again around 1900 and both of those burned right around 1900 too, both of those buildings. So behind the building in the front that uh, with the two bell towers yeah. that is uh, that was the Victoria Mill, it was early, the James Mill first then the Victoria Mill that was a shoe manufacturer and then as you noticed what looks like a ship sort of heeled over on its side in the middle of the town yeah is actually uh, the docks at the time would run all the way up to Water Street. So what you're seeing there is a ship that's heeled over so it can be repaired on the bottom. But it's at the dock, the inshore end of the dock between Johnson's and Bartlett's Wharf. So it looks like it's in the middle of the city, but it really is. It, the water actually goes all the way right up there to, to, to the street. And then in the front here, you'll see that paddle wheeler that seems obvious. And, and again, if you just look at that picture, you're like, yep, that's a nice picture. But at this resolution, you can see Ohio printed on the side, obviously. This is, it was a steamship, yes. It was a side paddle wheeler. It was built uh, April 7th. It, it was actually built in 1846 here in Newburyport by Jackman Shipyard. It was the first side wheeler that was built and used here on the Merrimack. And it would make regular runs between here and Boston for John Wooden's son. I guess they had some kind of a contract with that uh, specific, uh, they, they were on commercial wharf. This was, nope, right here. So they sold this ship in 1847. So you can see when uh, Fitzhugh Lane engraved this or drew it and then engraved it. He caught this Ohio for the only year that it actually was here in, in Newburyport. It was in 1846. By 1847, they'd sold it, and it was doing runs between uh, New Orleans and Galveston, Texas. So. <laughs> Over the pilot house, which is in the front here of the Ohio, you'll see another wharf there. That's Davenport's, and it was called Bailey's later on. So. Mm -hmm. Moving upriver, we see this large brig here to the left, and that was at uh, Cushing's Wharf, which is, was more accurately Cushing's Wharves. He had two uh, sort of connected right there. And if you'll notice, it doesn't have quite as much rigging as some of those other ships in the picture, and that's because it was actually being rigged right there. There was a contract that, um, that Cushing had, uh, the Cushings had with the Pritchard family. They were riggers, and they would rig ships right there. They rented space. The uh, next is that small schooner there, sort of in the middle of the picture, and that's docked. Um, that's where Commercial Wharf is. The slip that that, that, that boat is in went all the way up to, to the street, too. And that was another one of those. Uh, the next slip, which is this sort of empty space right here, uh, was used as a mast yard, actually, at the time. And then there's Carter's Wharf and Fowler's Wharf. And in between the two, there's a ship being built. And because Cheney had such an encyclopedic knowledge of dates and when things were built and whatever, he actually tells us that that is the bark Lanark that's under construction at this time, right there. So. <laughs> that's amazing. It really is. And I mean, the detail in this picture is amazing, too, because you don't actually notice it. So, yeah. I would also just point out uh, two things. One was um, the smokestack which is right there by the first mast of the ship, and the uh, bell tower. Those were, that, was, that belonged to the Globe Mill. It was one of the biggest mills here in the, in the city. It was called Peabody's later, and it's actually, that is actually where the tannery is now. So. And that right there is Old South Church behind it. We finally found Old South Church. Nope, behind that bell tower, it's the taller. It's the taller spire. And then I know people, I, I did check to see what that was because I didn't recognize that either. Apparently that was the old Universalist church. It was at the corner of Middle and Fair Streets. 
And apparently it was, uh, they ended services there around 1880 and it became a glue factory for a little while. <laughs> and then like, every, like half of everything here burned down in 1900, so yeah. That's, uh. All right, this one's a little tough to see and I sort of am upset about this one myself because the custom house is between the, the back two masts there, so you can't actually see it, unfortunately. But it's got its wharf there. You can maybe make out a few barrels and that sort of a thing on the wharf there. And then the next two, there's one that looks like barrels here, and then there's one that looks like it's got stacked lumber, and that's exactly what those things are. That was um, Gunnison and Granger wharves, side by side there where the lumber is. Next is Ferry Wharf, um, and that's where the original ferry to Rings Island ran, uh, started again in the 1680s, and it actually ran uninterrupted. Some form of ferry ran uninterrupted there till 1885, so, so long-lived service. And then finally, if you move down, and it's hard to see, but there's a small ship leaned over at the last wharf there, and that is called City Wharf. It was formerly where we saw Greenleaf. Um, the two towers of the Prospect Street Congregational Church are in the background there. I only see one, but it says two here. I guess I screwed that up. Oh, it's down on this end. I'm sorry, see them right there? And then the Bartlett Mill chimneys were right here. All right, so now we see the schooner here. That's tied up at the end of City Wharf. And then the next empty wharf there is uh, Central. And that long wooden warehouse, Cheney informs us, uh, was at the time being used by Charles Lunt, who had a fishing and import business. Uh, as we move down to Brown's Wharf, we see sort of this idea that we saw earlier where there's a brig that's sort of tipped over, and what they would do is put it up on blocks, and during low tide, when, it, when the tide would go out, the ship would lean over and they could work on the bottom of it. Of course, you had to rush like crazy to work on the bottom of it before the tide came back in. But that was kind of a kind of interesting work at the time. And uh, that, that is at, uh, as I said, Brown's Wharf, and that would be Moses Brown, who um, had made his fortune right around 1800 and about 10 years beyond that in the West Indies trade. There used to be a, uh, there used to be a distillery there, a brick building that was a distillery. Are you amazed there's so much detail in this picture? It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yes. So we'll move up river again, and now we see a little bit more of Brown's Wharf that starts the, the image here. And then the open area that continues sort of behind the ship that you can't actually see, uh, that was a shipyard, and there was a wharf back there. It was Horton's, and later McKay's, and then eventually Atkinson and Fillmore. So the shipbuilding happened there for a long time. And then there's two schooners, you can see one easily, there's one sort of stuck in the back there that's tied up at um, Patches Wharf. And Cheney was surmising that these two schooners uh, would have been owned by French and Horton, which was a company uh, in the area that had a bakery on Merrimack Street that uh, shipped hardtack everywhere. <laughs> Apparently that was their specialty. <laughs> hardtack is not, not great. <laughs> And then finally in this view, uh, we can see what's called Williams Wharf here, and it's got that building, and again, you can see, make out, I guess, a little bit of what looks like lumber there, and that's because that was a lumber yard also. And then following that, you see the trestle there of the Eastern Railroad um, to the left of the mast there in the foreground. And the trestle, the train would run on top of it and then continue on top of the barn bridge there. And that barn bridge is where the earlier other chain bridge was that we saw. That was the one it was built in 1827. The barn bridge replaced it in 1840 to carry the railroad tracks across the top. But you could still sort of walk or drive a cart through underneath, and it was a toll road. So we had a multi-level bridge back in 1846. <laughs> Just to sort of finish the story here of Fitzhugh Lane, we have this piece in the next room, and I'm sure people have seen it. If you haven't, please, uh, please go in and check it out afterwards. But this is Newburyport Harbor, and it was painted by Lane about probably 15 years after he did this engraving that we just looked at. Um, obviously a fellow that was familiar with intimate detail of Newburyport, as we just saw, 
this view of the harbor echoes his earlier work, not just because half of it is the sky, as you can see, which, you know, he was a luminous painter, so they were all very interested in light and what was going on in the sky every time. So you can still pick out, you know, the churches and the mill buildings and that kind of a thing. And I would also note that this sort of thing that looks like shredded wheat in the front there on a boat, that's, uh, <laughs> that's salt hay. And that was an industry which existed really from the time that Newbury was settled um, in 1635. People, even at that point, were apportioned uh, marsh property lots because they would, so they would be able to cut their own, for their own use, uh, salt, salt marsh hay. And um, it continued really into the early 20th century as an industry. So again, this was done in about 1860, and also around that time we have some early photographs from uh, the, the probably some of the earliest that were in uh, Cheney's collection. I'm actually going to start with one from 1880, which is a little later, but um, the photography era had sort of arrived, and now we can see a few actual photographs of the area here. This is Green Street, looking down towards the river. You can almost make out the edge of City Hall on the left of the picture there, like to the left of the tree, the, the first tree. And then all these little buildings along the side here, they were, they were residences that had been turned into sort of commercial slash residence. Uh, you know, people would do business out of their homes kind of a thing. Um, they tore all those down in uh, 1920 to build the police station. Uh, you can see at the end of the street here, there's a cove that doesn't, you know, if you looked from Green Street, now you'd obviously see buildings in the way, and there's a little bit of a, um, there's a little bit of a parking area there and that kind of a thing. But what's interesting is at the time, that Gambrell roofed building way in the back there, you can kind of see it's the hip roof in the back. That was on the other side of Merrimack Street, so close to the water. And that was uh, originally Moses Brown's counting house. So it was like, it was located right there, yeah. It still is, yeah. Okay. Moving east, this is Market Square, so to speak. <laughs> it's the back of the market house, which is the firehouse now. And what's interesting is to see here, and especially if you go walk down the street afterwards and go take a look, you can see the basement level windows and doors down there. Now if you go walk by the firehouse, especially if you go up the um, brick walkway between Not Your Average Joe's and the North Row, whatever's on the other side, it's a dress shop or something. Um, you can see, you know, about this much of those windows framing down underneath. It's been buried that high. So that whole bottom story it basically has been buried. And this foreground area that where all these boats are sort of up on the uh, dry, sort of dry land, the tide will come back in eventually. But that's where the park is right now. Next, next is my favorite picture if you're done. I'm sorry, I don't want to... Well, every... <laughs> This is also the market area, my personal favorite picture here. <laughs> this today is the uh, brick walkway bet that I just mentioned between North Row and um, the firehouse. And it looks right out to the cove where, you know, obviously before the park existed. And we can tell from this picture, can you guess what kind of business was on the basement level of the market house at that point? <laughs> That's one large swordfish there, yeah. Yep. Yep, and the table is right here in the other room. No, just kidding, just kidding, <laughs> kidding, kidding. You never get the smell of fish out of that table. <laughs> Later on, they would call this Railroad Avenue, and we'll see why in a couple of minutes here. Moving again, sort of further east, we get to Greenleaf's Wharf, and what's really interesting about this picture is not just the date, which is around 1850, it's very early. And because it's very early, we're lucky enough to be able to see these warehouses. And what these warehouses were, were essentially, they look basically the same as they did when they were built around 1810. So you're seeing a photograph pretty much of, you know, one of the, the original warehouses that were on that wharf. Four stories. Yeah, they were, some of them were big. You know? I won't spend too much time on this which is uh, from the 1880 era. And a lot of towns, I'm sure, probably your own, if you don't live here in Newburyport, which I don't, I have a hop, uh, picture from Hopkington where I live exactly like this, except it's Hopkington, and it shows the, the important buildings in our town, which at the time were the mills. And uh, as you can see here, it's sort of the same idea. 
they called these bird's eye views and actually not much longer after this sort of aerial photography almost came in. Uh, they used to actually send cameras up on balloons originally and then, and then once airplanes kind of got going, uh, it obviated the need for these sorts of things. But they're actually very accurate. They try and depict the buildings in fairly good detail. Yep, and I'll just point out here the rail line, which you can see now is two separate. It doesn't go over Barn Bridge anymore. The, the roadway has been now just turned into a, you know, a pedestrian slash cart roadway at this point. And the train is on its own um, track over here. And you can see from this picture, the track comes into Newburyport and goes all the way around the city and then comes back out onto the waterfront. It doesn't go directly like, like you'd expect, you know. So to take a left there and hit the waterfront. <laughs> yep, it is a dead end at the end, that's right, yeah. I am gonna show that, yeah. Here's a close up of uh, that same image that we just saw. And this is, um, this is the image west of the custom house. You can see the custom house on the corner there. It's skinnier than it should be, but that's the perspective in this thing. And I've marked the wharves as best I could. Uh, they weren't actually marked on this map, but you can see Gunnison and Grangers specifically there. There's actually a large building there marked with an A. And that large building is the coal pocket. And folks know about the coal pocket. It was sort of the largest, one of the largest structures that was on the waterfront. We'll see some photographs of that in a minute. Um, the railroad had the effect of sort of one last revitalization almost of the waterfront area. And you can see where the rail line comes in here and it ends at that sort of unassuming little white building there. That was, uh, that was the depot and it's behind the firehouse where the firehouse is today. It connected the waterfront directly to rail transport, which was why there was a little bit of a recovery there. Prior to that, when things would come in by ship, they'd actually have to um, use carts to bring stuff from the wharf area up to a train depot. There was one at Winter Street where you'd expect it, and there was another one up by the Frog Pond. So. I also would point out, you can see Market Square up there, right there, where it says Market Square, and then above that there's a little tiny horse and carriage, and that is the, uh, the horse-drawn trolley, or the street railway as they called it. And that connected Market Square here to Market Square in Amesbury. So. Now we want to look obviously at the rest of it, so there's the view east of the Custom House. You can see the rail line that sort of cut across the wharfs there at that point, and then obviously later infilling, as you can imagine, would you know, start to create what we know today as the, the water line. But then what I'd point out again, this is probably tough to see, but you can see on Bailey's Wharf, right up above there. Right at the end of it is the Inner Range Lighthouse. And you know where that is because it's at the Coast Guard Station-ish, so it's that area. And then if you really have good eyes, if you follow that back, you can see the Outer Range Lighthouse at street level further back. If you go right up that sort of roadway after the wharf, you'll see that. So. Oh, yeah. What's the big white building there? That's, uh, must be one of the mills. Yeah, the one that was Globe earlier that we looked at. Here are some, so we were just looking at an 1880 uh, depiction there, so we'll, now we have some photographs from around the same time. This is a view from the coal pocket, actually, which is why it seems like it's elevated here. And it's westward along the waterfront. Um, this, in the foreground here, is, uh, this is City Wharf and that warehouse. I guess it had been turned or moved or something, but it was originally on Greenleaf's Wharf. Apparently so, but apparently that's where it was at the time. If you sort of step to the next um, wharf there, that was Mercantile Wharf, and you can see little like it looks like cubby holes almost in that building. That was uh, like shingles and lumber that they were uh, that they had stored there. And then there's a barge right in the front there with stone for the jetties <laughs> parked right there. If you go to the, so behind that thing with the cubbies, the next big building there, that was um, the brick warehouse on Brown's Wharf, trying to get some orientation here. And then interestingly in this photograph, uh, 
beyond Bronze Wharf we saw earlier would have been Atkinson of Fillmore Shipyard. And you can actually see a ship being built right up in the corner there, it looks like. Can you see that up there under construction? It's, uh, let me see if I can, there it is right here. That's a ship under construction right there. There's sort of an interesting photo. It's, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it one of a kind, but it is pretty, uh, pretty rare. This is the railroad depot. And you can see there's that little white building that we saw in the, the earlier picture. The firehouse is right there with the tower. It's sort of a square white tower. And that street that now is the brick walkway was railroad street, obviously, because it came all the way down to the railroad depot. So. And this depot, including the depot yard and what have you, would stretch, you know, along Greenleaf's Wharf down to like where North Row, basically. So. Progress continues. Here's the last of the uh, archeological maps from the excavation in 1977. This is uh, circa 1900 in this picture, and you'll see again the original 1700 red dotted line there where you can see now how much fill has been added. <laughs> it's really a sort of an unbelievable amount compared to the original contour of the, of the 1700 shoreline. Um, you can also see on this uh, drawing here the railroad tracks, obviously. You can see the huge coal pocket there. That's the Philadelphia and Reading Coal and Iron Company. And you can see the custom house there, which has been in the last couple. But there's the custom house to the extreme right. And you can see the little way that still is outside here, custom house way, but it's called custom house wharf here because originally, of course, that was a wharf. You can also see that running along custom house way or wharf is a building that says foundry. And you, that's no longer here, obviously, but it was stretching all the way down right outside here. So. And of course, coal was sort of the big industry right around this time. And I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll show you what a coal pocket is. So this photograph here, this is two pieces close up of a five piece composite photo, which is right here if you want to take a look at it later. This is around 1900, it shows the waterfront still has some activity. Um, there's some 19th century warehouses still there, but obviously the dominant feature here is that coal pocket. That's that big building you're seeing right there. It had a, what they call the cold shed beside it here. It was, and all that was was storage. It was just coal storage. This was sort of a, this Newburyport was, you know, like a, a, a transit point for coal. So there was a ton of it here that would then go out to the North Shore community. Where's it coming from? Everywhere, Pennsylvania. Some of it came from overseas. There is the coal pocket. This is a view of it from the river. <laughs> and you can see that the river's frozen over, so you could go out there with your camera and take a picture. It doesn't, yes, they're standing on the river, correct, yeah. That was all storage. It looks kind of like, I don't know, a factory or something, but that's all storage, actually. So it's just all full to the brim of coal. It's about five stories high. I'd also point out the custom house in this picture, finally. There it is on the left-hand side, so yeah. <laughs> Yes, that's right there, yes, where the parking lot is. You can see uh, coal was so popular that sometimes they actually overran the capacity of those massive storage buildings. And when they did, they would dump it outside. And they had a yard that they would put coal in. And you can see it in this picture. This location here is about where um, the entrance to the parking lot is today, yeah. out here, it's this way. And you can see it's stacked up against the back of that building. You can see these sort of high railroad, they're not railroad tracks, they're like really just trestle to, you know, to bring little cars full of coal and dump it over the edge. Time marches on. And around the time of the Great Depression in the 30s, like a lot of um, areas, the textile industry moved south. Uh, fuel oil began to replace the coal industry. Of course, it would replace it almost completely. But Newburyport's shallow harbor and bar um, precluded participation of the community here in sort of the new maritime economy that was centered on tankers and uh, um, you know those container shipping containers that kind of a thing. So the waterfront and the commercial area stagnated and this is a picture that shows Merchant Row that's Water Street to the right and it comes back along you know the, the wharf at the time that 
along Ferry Wharf, actually. So the Depression, of course, that was tough on everybody. But this is the fame. Yeah, everybody's seen this picture, I'm sure. This is the back of the Custom House, circa 1950. Uh, this is when Jacob Checkaway had a uh, scrap metal business that he began here during the Depression. Um, you know, these types of businesses flourished. They were necessary industries, so anybody who disparages this, I would ask them not to do that because during and after World War II, they were very necessary to recycle, uh, you know, these old uh, parts, old, old metal parts. And, and what happened was a lot of these types of businesses were taken by eminent domain during urban renewal in sort of the 1960s, which happened to this building, obviously here in Newburyport. It also happened in nearby Portsmouth. They, they took a, a similar sort of a junkyard, if you will and a lot of other waterfront communities. Uh, these, these sorts of properties were taken. And then of course the sort of end of the story, which I won't again preempt anybody who's gonna talk later this week, but by the 1960s, the Redevelopment Authority had been created. Uh, they had a plan to sort of tear down much of the central waterfront and commercial district areas, replace them with what else in the late 50s, early 60s, a commuter-centered shopping plaza where you could drive to and leave your automobile. And then uh, several forward-thinking advocacy and citizens groups argued for a approach that now is sort of known as restoration and reuse, which um, again would have been sort of ahead of its time. And the uh, urban renewal plans from the 60s were revised in the 70s and the early 80s uh, to accommodate of what these interest groups um, were demanding. And it created basically what exists now as the current landscape here in Newburyport. And as you can see in this picture, and as you're experiencing tonight, the Custom House was saved and uh, has become this museum. And I thank you all for joining me tonight. And uh, 